Hello and welcome to the citation webinar called The Accident Rate Takes Care of Itself. My name is Lee Mills. I'm the Director of Health and Safety Services for Citation. The Accident Rate Takes Care of Itself is born out of the autobiography of a guy called Bill Walsh who was head coach of the San Francisco 49ers, an American football team. In the 1980s and 90s, uh, he was widely acclaimed as one of the best sports coaches ever. I'm very keen on applying sports psychology into business teams and Bill is famous for saying the score takes care of itself, meaning that if you get your training, nutrition, processes, attitude etc. correct, then you will get the right scoreline. I change this in a safety context because once you understand why people behave why they do, you know how to address their deficiencies in your business and manage emergencies correctly, your accident rate should take care of itself, i.e. you will have a low accident rate. And what I want to go through with you today in this webinar is uh, some interesting insight into why people behave like they do, why health and safety practitioners behave like they do, and if you're unfortunate to have an incident, how to control the outcome. Elon Musk, I think you will agree, is a very successful businessman. As the owner of Tesla and SpaceX, he has a net worth of $20 billion. Elon Musk had a number of accidents in his Tesla factory, and so he wrote the email on screen to all of his staff. Elon wanted to demonstrate to the workforce the value he placed in them as individuals and by offering to do the task and talk to workers after an incident, effectively what Elon is doing is modifying the risk assessment and implementing control measures from the top. This demonstrates good safety leadership. The benefits of good health and safety are increased productivity. You tend to get more efficient processes if you've got good health and safety because during processes such as the cost assessment or risk assessment, um, derivation, you identify inefficient uh, tasks that you undertake. You get improved quality and better communication and reduce repair costs. You get improved well-being, job satisfaction, and improved working climate. People want to work for you. Lower insurance costs and less hassle with insurers. You know, if you have incidents, um, there's a lot of dialogue has to take place between you and insurers with civil claims, and it could actually increase your, your, your insurance costs and that. Uh, Ultimately, and an improved organizational image. In the words of Stelios of EasyJet fame, if you think safety is expensive, try having an accident. So why do safety practitioners do what they do? A good healthy safety practitioner is somebody who regards health and safety as a vocation, not a career. We want to see people go home in the same condition they arrived in and we want to see people retire in a fit condition to enjoy their retirement, whatever that may look like. As health and safety practitioners, we often have to witness and deal with horrific events such as the one incident I dealt with when I was the health and safety director for the largest steel erector in the UK. The image on screen is Anfield. A number of pieces of steel were stored on the ground and two operatives were barring the steel, that is separating the steel so we can put chains around it to lift it into position. These pieces of steel were several metres long and, and weighed several hundred kilograms if not more. One of the pieces of steel, while we were barring it, fell over and trapped one of the operatives by the legs. He was so badly trapped and we thought he was so injured that we actually had a conversation at the scene about whether we should perform a double amputation, but fortunately that wasn't required. However, the operative still doesn't walk properly and never will. He also suffers from mental ill health even now. Hence, as safety practitioners, when we come into your premises, some of our advice may seem severe, but it's often born out of the fact that we've either suffered emotional distress or seen bad things such as this incident, or we've dealt with, with issues post-incident in terms of, you know, um, court cases, dealing with um, the families of, of the injured um, and we know that not fully implementing health and safety control measures has this impact. So why do your people do what they do? Have your staff ever driven above the speed limit, used their handheld phone whilst driving, driven a motor vehicle having consumed alcohol, running across the road in front of a vehicle without using a pedestrian crossing? Use a hand tool without the correct PPE. Why do people do this? Usually it's to save time and inconvenience. Human beings are time-saving machines. No one 
ever tells you the long way to do something, they always show you a shortcut. I want to go through something now called the spiral. If you look at the top of the spiral, time versus risk, 168 drive. What does 168 mean? 168 is the number of hours in a week. We all have only 168 hours, irrespective of whether we're young and old, rich or poor. It never flexes, apart from when the clocks go back or forwards, of course. Hence, we take shortcuts to give us the time to do the things we like. Receive Wisdom tells us it takes 21 days to form a habit, hence the 21 days on the right hand side. If the shortcuts you've been taught or learned are unsafe, such as not wearing PPE, and you get away with it, i.e. you don't get harmed, then you will continue to do it because you're saving time. When these things become habitual, 99.7% of everything you do every day is habitual. From how you dress, how you clean your teeth, to where you park at the office, which locker you use at the gym. So you will develop these unsafe habits and keep doing them. Think about learning to drive. Initially, you learn consciously. Then after a while, your mind says, you like doing this a lot. I'll make it into a habit. And then you drive subconsciously, i.e. without thinking about it. Have you ever driven to work and cannot remember how you got there? And conversely, if you're driving and a police officer comes in behind you, how do you drive then? And that's because you're going from driving subconsciously to consciously. So, your mind is the same with unsafe habits. You do them a lot, so they become subconscious. You don't know you're doing these unsafe habits. Then there's alpha time. Alpha is a brainwave. We all have alpha time. Effectively, this is when our minds have to download and file all that it has had to deal with recently. And we generally go into alpha roughly 10 minutes in every hour. Not all at the same time, and it's not always 10 minute chunks. It can be one, two minutes at a time. When we're in alpha, we have no judgment of what is right or wrong, so we cannot self-correct unsafe habits. So, if you get away with unsafe shortcuts, you will continue to do this, and then you find more and more shortcuts. And because in alpha, you have no judgment, so you cannot self-police. This is a downward spiral, eventually resulting in an accident or incident. How do you stop this? You stop it by having a culture where it's okay for, to challenge others for doing these things they cannot see. Your colleagues aren't necessarily stupid when they do unsafe things. They cannot see what they're doing wrong sometimes since these unsafe habits are done subconsciously. So how to avoid a prosecution? Simple really, don't commit a criminal offence. I'm joking. You need to ensure you follow the Deming cycle. Plan, implement, check that the control measures are working, take remedial action, such as that indicated by citation for your citation client. Follow guidance, such as that from us. And similarly, if you have an issue, ensure you call our HS advice line as soon as possible. Lastly, the sentencing guidelines came in February 2016 and are a game changer in how criminal offences for health and safety are dealt with. More on this later. Number two, make it easier to defend yourself. The difference between an accident, near miss and death can be inches or seconds. I've witnessed such in a previous role. We reviewed a construction site CCTV imagery to see how one of the vans on site was damaged. When we did the review, however, we noticed that the van was damaged by a 20 ton piece of steel swinging on the end of a crane and hitting the van. What no one had reported to us, however, was the fact that the st steel swung over the heads of three operatives who had to duck as it went over the top of them. Had they not ducked, they would have been seriously, if not fatally, injured. Secondly, have good scrutiny, e.g. undertake inspections and audits. Ensure you document control measures such as training, guidance documents, uh, key cards, handbooks, etc., document management practices such as if you've had a conversation with somebody about their behavior ensure you document it you may need to rely on it later ensure you always have adequate supervision of the tasks you're undertaking the legal test of prosecution is if the incident was bad enough to desire a criminal sanction it doesn't need to be an injury number three stop digging Ensure you preserve evidence. Ensure you barrier off the area. Take images if you can. 
get documentation and scan it or take images of the documentation. In the event of a serious incident, the HSC will come onto site or into your offices and take documentation away and give you a receipt for that documentation. But you don't necessarily know what they've got. So for quite a while, you can be working blind. That's why we recommend you, to, you scan relevant documentation, risk assessments, training records, etc., etc., so that when you're doing your investigation, you know what you've got. Ensure you take legal advice. If you're a citation client, we have access to a regulatory solicitor trained in health and safety. So if you require advice, please call us. Ensure you adequately engage legal privilege. Do not tidy up, collude, correct paperwork. The HSC now have forensic IT consultants who can spot if you've amended a document. And do not refuse access to an inspector. Number four, planned response. Ensure you engage a solicitor early in the process to ensure you have legal privilege. Ensure you have a strategy. Decide how bad the incident could be and act accordingly. Maintain a single point of contact so you know who knows what. In a former life, we went to court over a fall from height issue, thinking we knew the key facts of the case. What we didn't know was that one of our employees had given a witness statement to the HSC, which contradicted everyone else's statement and hence we had to concede. Ensure your insurers are on board and that you have directors and officers insurance. Train staff in the emergency strategy and ensure you communicate it. It's no use sat on a shelf. Number five, remember the risk. Remember the risks you face if you get it wrong when you're thinking about the cost of control measures. Under the sentencing guidelines, the judiciary will look at culpability versus degree of harm versus likelihood of harm. So a small company, say two million to 10 million pounds turnover with low culpability and harm category one, which means death, would mean a fine in the range of 25 to 130,000 pounds on the tables on the right of this slide. However, if another company had the same turnover, two million to 10 million, but a very high culpability, meaning a flagrant disregard for health and safety, then that fine could be 1.6 million pounds. This doesn't include the civil case and PR damage. So to conclude, you need to develop safe processes. They need to be easily adoptable if they are to become habitual. You need to ensure any habits are safe as opposed to unsafe habits. You do this by training, education and knowledge and repeat and reinforce where necessary. You need to develop this by having a safe culture, which can be defined as the way things are done around here, or the one that I prefer is how your staff behave when you're not there. This concludes our session on the accident rate takes care of itself. If you are an existing citation client and have any questions around health and safety or HR, please call our 24 seven advice line. If you are not a citation client yet, please call our friendly colleagues on 0345 844 1111 to see how we can help you and your business. Thank you.